You are live now. Okay, welcome back folks. Um, we're continuing our work. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. We're continuing our work this afternoon. And we have with us our Joint Fiscal Committee, uh, most important person. <laughs> You're gonna be really important, Dan, as we work through the session. Um, one thing we asked Dan to do is to look through the um, budget adjustment, general fund, uh, just to put in context our uh, pieces that we need to make a recommendation for. It has been sent to our web page. It is under our date. If your date is already open with some documents, you need to close it, refresh it, and open this back up for this. So Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you to explain your document and help us figure out what we need to uh, make recommendations to a probe sign. Thank so you, Dan, Madam. if you could also just um, introduce yourself for the record before okay. we start. Um, my name is Daniel Dickerson with the Joint Fiscal Office, um, and I did prepare a document that um, has the the various items in the governor's budget adjustment request that um, fall under your jurisdiction. Um, before I jump into the document, I, I don't want to assume that everybody on the committee knows all the various ways that that funding or spending authority moves in the appropriations bill. Uh, would it be appropriate for me to give sort of a breakdown of that as far as appropriations and reversions and transfers, or, or are you all pretty familiar with how that works. I think that would be better when we start looking. I know one thing we want to really look at is the bigger picture of the DOC budget later on okay. after we get through this. That might be a good place to have those kinds of conversations. Does that make okay. sense? Sure. Um, Some of that will, I think, be in play while I walk through the sheet. But if, if folks have questions, feel free to ask me and I can clarify on some things. But okay. um, going right to line one, um, this is uh, 4.9 million that would be appropriated to um, the corrections, correctional services uh, appropriation unit. And this would be ongoing funding. Um, and this is for the the bonuses and other things to sort of make those um, corrections jobs uh, more enticing and, and increase retention. So this is where I want to stop you. Is this 4.9 million on top of what is currently budgeted for their salaries? Yes. So this 4.9 is on top of what is current, what would currently be budgeted for COs, uh, salaries, and shift inf differentials. Now, my right. understanding was through the memo that this increase would expire at the end of March of this year. And you just said it's ongoing, so. Uh, the document that I looked at portrayed it as ongoing, but I can certainly um, look back and, and find clarifications. And I, I apologize if I ultimately ended up uh, misportraying that. No, it's, this is what we're trying to grapple with here. I'm trying to find, because we do have it in our documents here. Would it be on Tuesday? Yes. Yes. State of Vermont, the SCA, DOC recruitment. Um, it is effective for payroll period beginning uh, August 29th, 2021 through payroll period, March 12th, 22. Okay, I, I apologize that I uh, misstated that. Um, I have the document open now. So uh, that's So why yes, this, this should be portrayed as, as one-time money um, instead of ongoing. So it's a 4.9 plus increase to the DOC budget that they pay for salaries, but it's only in effect until March 30th of this year. And it's from August 29th to March 30th. 
Yes. Um, so then what happens afterwards? It's March 12th. March 30th. It's, it's both. <laughs> Oh. During the period beginning October, August 29th through March 30th, individuals hired. Okay, so they may have it broken down separately. Um, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. number five might, number five in that memo might go beyond March. Who may in the discretion of management otherwise be paid straight time for hours worked over schedule shall be eligible to receive time and a half that's your differential that is for your different shift differential i think because part of it was for recruitment part of it was retention and part of it was your shift differential So we're going to schedule tomorrow. We have the commissioner of DOC coming in and we're going to go through this. And we've also will be scheduling VSCA to come in after uh, the testimony from DOC for this. Okay. Are there I questions? will tell you one thing. I yeah. did find out where this academy was. Where? Up in Lindaville in the industrial park. I went up this summer. Good. Good. We met want... all the new new people that were getting ready to be uh, graduated. Were you impressed? I was. I mean, you wouldn't even know it was there. <laughs> yeah, they do it right up the road from Linden State. I've seen them up there when my daughter was in college up there training. Yeah. So Dan, um, we're going to look a little deeper into this tomorrow with the Commissioner of Corrections, but I just want to be clear that the 4.934 is on top of what they currently are budgeted for, for salaries. And it might be good if, if you could find out what the current budget is for their salaries, just so that we can see what that 4.9 really how much more that is okay okay um the next line here is um it's the same appropriation line from the budget the corrections correctional services this is the 6.3 million reversion of prior year carry forward to the general fund um, and the reason that this large carry forward balance exists is that uh, correctional services was able to um, offset general fund with uh, coronavirus relief fund money um, last fiscal year, uh, which allowed them to save that general fund and carry it forward. Um, and so um, it'll be reverted to the total general fund, although as you can see in the line above it, 4.9 million will come back to be used for those um, retention incentives um, or the one-time uh, retention incentives in FY22. Could I ask a question, Madam Chair? No, yeah, I'm just reading that. Yeah, go ahead. Sarah. Yeah, so this is for Dan. Um, so if, if, if I'm understanding this correctly, this there's money, I understand the backfill from the CRF, the 6,361. Is it fair to understand that that can cover some of these bonuses and some of these, I mean, that's what's happening here, right? Yes, uh, those, those bonuses and, and incentives um, were able to be paid using those coronavirus relief fund monies, um, same as in the healthcare field and, and in some, other, and some of the other frontline fields, um, but the, the relief fund money um, or the, the expiration date for using the relief fund money was December 31st. Um, and so we now have to switch to another source um, to continue that. That makes sense. So this 6.3 million was general fund that was replaced with the CRF dollars. 
Yes. And of that 6.3 of the CRF dollars, 4.9 of those CRF dollars are being used to augment the salary? Um, I wouldn't, that I, I, I don't know the, the makeup of that 6.3. I guess um, the reason I, I made the linkage is just that you've got the 6.3 million that was not used in FY21. It's gonna be reverted or swept back into the general fund in FY22 per the governor's um, budget adjustment request. And then you know, it, can, it can then be reallocated elsewhere. Um, so if we were, if we were to say, or if we were to assume that, you know, the, the, the reverted money is then going back to corrections in FY22, um, which is the way I sort of portrayed it, although it's not, that's not perfectly accurate, but, but, um, but yeah, essentially the money's going back into the general fund from FY21 and is now being redeployed two corrections in FY22 to provide these one-time incentives. Hopefully I explained that clearly. So in essence, it's still general fund because the general fund got replaced in FY21 with CRF. Yes. Right? So this 6.3 was savings that we made in the general fund that they're now saying <clears throat> those general fund dollars can be used for the 4.9 million addition for the salaries. Yes. Okay. And that came out of correctional services. So that is just regular correctional, the re regular correctional budget, correct? Yes. Nothing specific in terms of what happened in corrections, just their regular general fund appropriation. Yeah. And if, if you would like, I can. I can find the breakdown of how those federal dollars were used. If I don't know if that would be helpful for the committee, um, the the six point three million that um, in savings of the general fund that was deployed as um, CRF. Um, you know, I, I assume it's probably mostly, you know, retention pay salaries. But if if you'd like to break down, I can get it for you. Let's hold off on that for now. Okay. I'm just concerned that. What this is saying is the freed up general fund dollars that was in corrections is going six four point nine of the six point three is going to honor the contract that was agreed to between the administration and the union. Yes. Okay. Questions on this? Okay, let's go to the next item. Um, items three and four are, are directly related, and this is um, going back to Act 154 of 2020, which was the, um, the fiscal year 21 big bill. Um, language in that bill required that um, any carry forward from at the end of FY21 in the out-of-state beds appropriation unit um, would be held for FY22 to um, be utilized for community-based service programs within correctional services. So, so there was 417,000 in out-of-state beds um, that'll be pulled from that appropriation line item and be transferred over to the correctional services appropriation line item to be used specifically for the community-based service programs. And we made that agreement, <clears throat> I don't think it was last session, I think it was the session before, that we made those agreements that whenever there's any savings in our out-of-state beds, we have out-of-state beds in Mississippi, and if we project, and I'm, I'm saying this to remind everyone, but also to help Larry come along, every year in the budgeting process, there's a projection of how many beds we would use out of state. In Mississippi, we pay an X amount per day per inmate to house them. We project, the administration projects, how many inmates we'd hold over the year and what that would cost. So if you've got 
say a $24 million um, line item in DOC for out-of-state bids, and you only expend 20 million, that 4 million reverts back, and it reverts back to DOC to provide correctional services. And we, the intent is really to um, go towards the justice reinvestment initiatives. Instead of just going to the bottom line, it is targeted. And that's what this 417,000 is. Kurt? Uh, yes, uh, my concern on this is that this is supposed to be additive over the years. So that if, if we make two, 2 million savings one year, that goes to uh, justice reinvestment. If the next year we make 4 million, there should still be, there should therefore be 6 million more than the base from two years ago. Do you see what I mean? But you're not carrying 2 million over. You're, you may, I don't know if it builds the base of their budget. It you're assuming it builds the base, but it, but your savings aren't consistent year to year. So it's not uh, in a way that, in a way they are because if if the if at the beginning of justice reinvestment we had a hundred out of state um, inmates and the first year we dropped ten then we have a savings the second year we drop another ten we still have twenty that we're saving over that space of time so we should be taking that and reinvesting it in the community services the whole savings for every all of them over the years mm -hmm. that's the whole purpose of it yeah i don't know if it dollar wise if it works out quite like that i don't know i mean that's how we perceive it but i don't know if that's how it really works through yeah well that should be the goal and that's what i'm trying to that's yeah. why i would like to be able to to trace that better and make sure that that is indeed what we're attempting to do mm -hmm. so we need to know what is being spent on the community services um those grants and things to see whether that is actually increasing each year by the, at least by the amount that's coming back from the out of state inmates. Mm -hmm. My question was kind of, kind of related and it might relate to Dan and it, when it's appropriate. No, go for it. It was just processing. Yeah, well, I think when I think back of what we were doing with justice reinvestment, the idea was that we were gonna invest the money that was saved from out-of-state beds into the services in the community. And the way that I just heard Dan say this, that this is going back to service-based programs within DOC's budget. And that concerns me a little bit that it still is within DOC. I, I feel like we probably at some point could get some clarity on that and what our intent and purpose was for that money? Is it supposed to be for the community services that are within our designated agencies? Um, or is it, because I think it's about not having people go into an incarcerative setting to begin with, or, um, so I don't know, or maybe it is appropriate for that to go to the housing, you know, transitional housing. But I I've, I've was hoping that this session, we could get better clarity on what specifically it is and to Kurt's point, like that it's not just getting absorbed into that budget line so that it's a flat line, but that it builds greater capacity. So the commissioner is coming in tomorrow. Yeah. We'll be going through this. So that's a question to ask, do these dollars stay just within DOC or is it a pass through of DOC to DMH and to um, contracts for transitional housing and that sort of thing? And we may not be able to do a deep dive on this in the short period of time that we need to um, make a recommendation to a probes is my concern. So that may end up being a deeper dive after we finish this, we start doing a deeper dive in the weeks ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's, what I'm, that's why I said this session and understanding our time constraints on the budget adjustment. Mm -hmm. So flag that, and um, Kurt, also flag your question that you could ask the commissioner tomorrow. Yes, I'll, I'll be asking Trevor the same question and, okay. and the commissioner when he comes in. Okay, great. 
So basically it's a 417,000 that we saved on out-of-state beds this year. Um, and that's gonna revert back to DOC in one form or another to be used for things in one form or another. And we can get more clarity on that with the commissioner tomorrow, what those community-based service programs are. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Dan, number five. Um, number five is a transfer of $1,877,092 from the general fund to the Correctional Industries Internal Service Fund um, to address a deficit balance. Um, so it, it, the way the, the budget adjustment request portrayed it, it's, a, it's just a one-time transfer to address that um, deficit in FY22. Um, so this one is a, a bigger issue than just transferring money. And <clears throat> we have a Vermont Correctional Industries that is supposed to be self-sustaining where they produce items that they can sell and then those sale, uh, uh, the money coming in from the sales will go back into the program to um, pay for the program. And we've got to really start looking at this correctional industries program. It's really been weaned down quite a bit. Um, and I think COVID has really impacted it as well. So this is putting 1.8 million of general fund dollars to backfill a hole in, in this particular fund. Karen? Yes, I, I think I would echo those sentiments, especially after we just had the conversation with BGS and, you know, addressing their deficit and kind of we're like, what are the things that are in place so this stops happening? Like, I would be curious to have those same conversations with VCI um, and DOC to, to look at what are they doing? Or is this going to be an every year, there's going to be a, a backlog that we're going to have to backfill. So I guess, is that a question for the commissioner, which should be able to address tomorrow? Well, we can ask them. I, I, think, I think this one in particular is going to take legislative work that's beyond budget adjustment. Because I think we really need to get into the Community High School of Vermont and Correctional Industries because they're becoming linked now. Uh, where before they were very, very separate. One was really just education and the other one was learning some trades or working in producing case goods that they could then sell and those revenues from the sales came back into the fund to buy materials and keep it going. And now those two programs have kind of merged. So I think it's time for us as a committee dealing with DOC policy that we really start looking at Community High School of Vermont and the correctional industries and, and how we go forward in the new model. And they may not be able to be sustained uh, financially with a revolving fund. Uh, Kurt? Uh, yeah, do we know if this is over, is this over years that this has been, the deficit is a, or is this a, a COVID thing? Is it just the last couple of years that we've encountered this deficit or is it ongoing? I don't know. I don't, hmm. I have okay. no idea. I, I can look into that and get you an answer to that question. That would be good to know. So these are the, items that we need to make um, a recommendation, our recommendation to a probes by next Tuesday. Another empty checkbook, huh? <laughs> well, I'm just wondering right off the bat, if this one, as I said, with the correctional industry that, that our recommend isn't to put this off and allow us to take a deeper dive into Community High School of Vermont and Correctional Industries to really find out what's going on before we make a recommendation to back, use general fund money to backfill a hole when we don't know how we're gonna go forward with that program. Karen? Uh, I feel like that makes sense from where I'm feeling as well. And I think, um, Madam Chair, you said that we, there might be a possibility for later on in the session for us to do a deeper dive in just the DOC budget in general. I feel like 
all these pieces are, are speaking to that even more of that. There's a lot of moving parts. And um, I, I feel like personally for me, I would like to have a better sense of the DOC budget in general to see how all these things put to, get put together. So we'll do that after the governor's budget is proposed on the 18th, the 19th or 20th of January. Let's see if we can do that and get it presented to us in a way that is not appropriations jargon because they look at it. The issue there with appropriations, they have individual committee members that take individual parts of state government and then sit down one-on-one -on -one with those finance folks for the respective departments. So they do the deeper dive. So the documents that come forward are documents like what Dan has put forward here. So you don't get the story behind the line item where in appropes, they work one-on-one -on -one with that department or agency and they do the deeper dive. So it's really hard for us as a committee to read these documents and know the backstory. Uh, Marsha? I, I agree with Kurt on wanting to know how long this is going on, but I'd hate to deprive them of doing this, you know, work, but it's not substantiating itself at 1.8 million if we go, if we're losing. Right. So and yeah, we don't know what, and we don't know what work they're doing now. No, so it'd be nice to. I agree. It'd be nice to know and check it out. And uh, you can't keep going digging the hole deeper. You gotta fill it in sometime. Because they used to have a really large woodworking shop up at the Newport facility where they built a lot of case goods that were sold to nonprofits and to schools. And yes, the case yes. goods were like bookcases, storage units, desks, chairs. And then they were sold and the money from those sales came back into the program. We, have, we still have the license plates. Um, we used to have printing. Uh, a lot of printing was done. So a lot of the you know sales from the printing were done. We used they, to they do made stuff in Windsor. Signs. Hmm? They made stuff in Windsor too. Right. So a lot of that has been squeezed and closed and we're telling them they have to be self-sufficient, but there's nothing there that they can sell to bring in the money. So we've got to really take a look at this program. Okay, Dan, and then six and seven is what we just spoke about the 20 and 30 million. I mean, 20 and 10 million. was number six and number seven. So this is very helpful. This is very helpful. Thanks. I, I apologize that I didn't have answers to all your questions. I'm going to try to get caught up on these issues quickly so that I can be more useful than I am currently. Wait till we get into the Capitol bill. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is very helpful. I mean, this puts it in context. Um, but we are going to, and I wanted to get this done before the Commissioner of Corrections came in. So we didn't, we knew what to ask and not go in there blind. So this is very, very helpful. And um, so tomorrow afternoon, we have the Commissioner of Corrections. And Dan, if, if you're available, you might want to zoom, zoom in if you're available for that. Okay, anything else before we shift? Kurt? Well, I would. <laughs> I was just curious as to whether the the fact that the twenty and the ten add up to thirty, and there's a JFO note about thirty one million in reversions. So, I, I was just wondering whether those numbers match for some reason. Who's your thirty one million in reversions? Uh, that was on. It was the JFO note that came along with that email that you oh, that forwarded from uh, Approps. Yeah, I have no idea. Dan? If you don't mind me speaking up, um, I think the, the new spending throughout state government reflects not only the, the 31 million in reversions of unspent money, but it also reflects the the uh, July 2021 state revenue forecast, which projected general fund to be much higher than it had been forecast to be back in January of 2021. 
And I, I can't, I don't have the number off the top of my head of what the general fund grew to, but um, it's the, the new spending is not just from reversions. It's also from that new, um, the, the updated revenue forecast. So the updated revenue forecast, you could end up with FY22 with a surplus. So what the administration is doing is going to spend that surplus in FY22 instead of having it roll over to FY23 in simple terms. Does that make sense? So it's possible that that 31 is related to the 20 and the 10, and they're just trying to keep it within the same budget year. Huh, okay. Well, it possible. may not be that specific 30. It could be the forecast uh, that they projected for revenues for the general fund budget are coming in higher than what they had anticipated. So your budget's gonna have a surplus at the end yeah. of FY22. Oh. So they may be trying to spend that surplus so that it doesn't go into the FY23 budget. But this is the reversion is from 21, the 30, the 30. But that may have already one. been accounted for in their budget adjustment proposal. That That's what I'm saying. It might be the 20 and the 10. Hmm? That's what I'm saying. It might be the 20 and the 10. No, what I'm saying is that 31 reversion may have already be accounted for in the governor's original budget proposal in the middle of December. Oh, oh, oh. Huh, okay. I don't know. That's All right, why I, I have not to. On appropes. I have to jump off so I can go to Senate Appropriations. Um, okay. So thank Good you luck. for having me. Thank you, Dan. We'll see a lot more of you. Okay. So let's shift gears. And if, if Phil, if you could put up on the screen the memo that came from the advisory committee as to what the recommendation uh, is, was, Yes, yeah, so I will. I will admit Eric, Joe, Janet, yes, and Trisha. Yes, yep. please. He said, "Bill sent us that." I know. I want to put it up on the screen so everybody can see it. So people are really clear what the memo says, so we can see the language. If you have it on your iPad or whatever, you can bring it up as well. But I think the language is really important. For people to see. Okay. What's your vote, committee members? Keep on going. Oh, are they voting? What are they voting on, Eric? They're just voting on whether or not to keep on talking or to take a break. Oh, really? How come there's three people in the committee room? Wait, what are you? I'm seeing the state house room three. That's us, Alice. Can you hear us? Yeah. Sure. That's Janet. Oh, all right. That's you guys. Okay. Yeah. Trisha and Janet are in. And we're sitting in room three. Okay. <laughs> I but I heard Joe Benning talking about a vote. <laughs> I was thinking it was his committee room. I'm gonna turn him down. I'm in two committees at once. He's yeah. now um speaking with Matt Valerio about courthouses and John Campbell and uh, a, a cavalcade of uh, interested parties in reopening courthouses. So. We're doing too much. Oh, so anyway, one, can you, Janet and Trish, it's really hard to see you in this little block, but you're there. Um, I wanted to show the committee the language that the advisory committee voted on on a vote of 1003 in support of. Um, and this would be the language that we would use as a basis. And it's the advisory committee recommends to management and joint rules that the FY22 budget adjustment include 1.5 million. In, in general funds to issue, or it could be just in funds, they can figure out where the funds would come from 
uh, to issue a request for proposal for programming and schematic design development for expansion of the state house. And that this include the infrastructure needs for any future phases of expansion. So that would be sort of the scope if we make this recommendation to approach that this um, could look like. Um, one thought that we had this morning is trying to figure out who would put out the RFP and who gets the 1.5 million. Some folks, I think, I think the committee, committee was split where some folks felt it should go to BGS. Other folks are feeling, well, we don't have enough information for that. Maybe we should do it internally, but can we do it internally? And then I think everyone was sort of thinking that there should be a partnership for this. Um, we have in the past added projects in the capital budget that did not come through the governor's proposal. And this is where people right now are hung up. Why isn't the governor supporting this? This is basic civics. We're a separate branch of government. The governor is a separate branch of government. The judiciary is a separate branch of government. Um, we in the past have directed uh, money towards projects, the DGS that were not in the governor's proposal. We have done that uh, with DOC. We've done that with some projects within BGS. We've done that with some projects within forests and parks. We've done that with some projects within Agency of Natural Resources. So um, the governor doesn't always support projects that we do. Sometimes they're silent on them. Um, we get a proposal from the governor, but the legislature change, can change those proposals. It's the legislative branch that appropriates the money. So, um, we talked about a possible partnership. So if we did a partnership, we could have the money go to BGS uh, to do the RFP and be the lead agency um, in uh, this expansion, but they would have to also consult or in partnership with our Sergeant at Arms and with Tricia. That may be one option for that. So I just put that on the table here. So we have some hands up. So I'm going to go to Michael and then Kurt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Based on that note I sent you, when how would we like to work testimony from the administration so that we can, because I know you said this morning and several others expressed, they'd like to hear what's going on with them speaking of the administration. How would you like to handle that? So to bring the committee up to speed, Michael reached out to the administration during the break, during lunch break to find out what the scoop was. So maybe you could share with us what the scoop is. Well, what they, I talked to Kendall Smith and she indicated that we, or that she would like to, that she spoke with, I believe, um, Secretary Clouser, Secretary of the Interior of the Administration would like to testify with us to let us know their position on the state house expansion and let us know where I, you know, obviously what the governor's thoughts are on the monies that we're considering for this, uh, what their perspective is so that we could hear, I guess, the rest of the story. Okay. That so is I just, I just want to see how we would uh, get them into our committee to testify. Seem like several people were interested. Or am I mistaken? Well, I'm not sure. I'm I think not... we should know the whole story. I mean, there's gotta be some reason why they don't wanna do this. And like I says, we couldn't get a better opportunity or time to do it. And there's gotta be something out there or some reason why they're going against it. And I don't know what it is, but. Well, let's noodle that thought a little bit. Um, Kurt? I am once more confused. This, um, this memo is a recommendation to Joint Legislative Management Committee and the Committee on Rules, not to us. What is the Committee on Joint Management and Rules 
Are they going to make a recommendation to appropriations or something? So the discussion in the advisory committee, uh, the, the advisory committee needed to make their recommendations to joint management as well as joint rules. They had to do that for figuring out how we were going to come back into the building in January. And then we did that. And that was done in August. And then in September, we started working because the other part of the advisory committee's work was to figure out if we do an expansion, how we do it, do we not do an expansion? But our requirement for the advisory committee was to make our report to management and joint rules. So that's how this memo was drafted. Joint so management and joint rules has been so consumed with number one, getting us back into the building when the session started. Number two, the advisory committee, when we spoke about this said, we can go directly to, members can go directly to appropriations committee for this. And it was clear that with Senator Benning and myself on the advisory committee, that we would relay that information in November, December to the respective chairs, that this is a recommendation that the advisory committee is making. We know the administration is not gonna put this request in budget adjustment. We knew that back in November, that they didn't support this. So we had our conversations with the respective chairs. And this was back in November. When budget adjustment was proposed by the governor, middle of December, a week or so after that, I had a conversation with Representative Hooper and said, how should we proceed on this 1.5 million? And she said, talk about it with your committee and come in with a recommendation. So that's how it's played out. And part of it is because joint management and joint rules just didn't have the bandwidth to deal with it because they were struggling with getting us back into the building for that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Questions, thoughts? So, so this, are we gonna get them in here or not? Let me talk to the administration, Michael, and figure okay. out something. Okay. Okay, all right. I'll wait to hear from you, thank you. Questions? So if we submit language, if we do this, and submit language to budget appropriations. This could be um, the starting point for some of the language. So, questions, thoughts? Do people want to do an expansion of the state house? Uh, well, I can, my thoughts are, <laughs> I'm kind of going along with Representative Morgan. I want to hear more information about it before I can make any kind of decision on this. The legislature and I do think will drive this, Kurt. It's the legislature that's going to drive what our building is going to look like. We're yes, separate but, branch of government. Uh, absolutely. However, if we give a task to the administration, they are very capable of dragging their feet if they're not in favor of it. And it could very well take beyond 2025 or 20, whatever the deadline was for some of this, I think. Mm -hmm. So we want it, we want their enthused, their backing for it in order to get it done on time. Mm -hmm. So is the committee as a whole supportive of expansion of the state house? Ellis, could we just take the document down so we could see each other a little bit better? Is that possible? Yep. So I've asked that question, but I know that we've got three hands up. So Larry, Linda, and Sarah. You're muted, Larry. I think like I asked before, I would like to hear from the administration what their reluctance is to go along with this um, recommendation that we're willing to make and what is his alternative use 
of that 1.5 million that we do not know about. Okay. They may not be willing to come forward with that information in terms of what they want to use the 1.5 with because they have not presented the FY23 budget yet. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, but that's the way, you know, the event, like with the capital budget, when we did the um, update on projects, BGS was limited in terms of what they could talk about because there may be some changes in the FY23 capital budget that comes through with the governor's proposed budget. So they may be in the same bind here with that 1.5, but they can't be fully open with it at this point. Uh, Linda and then Sarah and then Karen. Um, thank you. So I think there's confusion at least there was from my part, I'm not saying because I wanna hear from the administration that they're driving it. Be getting information about cost estimates that they're concerned about why they don't want expansion. It's just information gathering. It doesn't mean they're driving it. So I think getting the most information in the short period of time is going to help us make strong informative decisions. It has nothing to do with the legislature versus the administration. So I want the information so that I can make an educated, informed decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Sarah and then Karen. So I, I think, um, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate, you know, wanting to get more information. I think one of the things that hasn't come into the committee yet today um, is you know the concerns that we've been hearing from legislators about how to adapt our workspace, you know, schools and other space, you know, businesses. Everybody's had to adapt uh, work workspaces, and frankly, I think the cafeteria is a place where um, I mean we're going to be living in a new time of living with this virus or the next one, and I think. Our cafeteria is one of the areas where we're so crowded. And I think, you know, I want to be able to get more information to be able to have the possibility of addressing this. This doesn't mean that we're at this stage that we're approving every like to move forward. It's about moving a process forward in a way that can utilize some one-time funding and work with a, a construction timeline that can make that happen. So I, I'm interested in hearing if there's time to get some more information, I'm totally open to that. But I, I think the, the, the legislative branch is responsible for, and this is our committee's jurisdiction, you know, the, the, the state house and the Capitol to make it, you know, to, to upgrade the, the, our facility. And this is, I see this in the context of, you know, we're, upgrading HVAC, we're doing a number of things. Um, uh, and, and it seems to me that it, there's advancing, there's a real advantage to getting this work, the thinking, the planning piece started so that we do have a better, uh, we have schematics and we have better, um, more inf detailed information so we can decide how to best move forward. Okay, Karen? Yes, I think um, Representative Coffey shared a lot of what I was going to reflect on um, is that this is a starting a starting point for us. And um, I guess the other thing that I'm hearing is, I think you said the vote for this was 10-03, um, which also, if maybe you could help remind us who those stakeholders were that voted for that. So it's not coming out of nowhere. There is a group that is saying that this is important for us to pursue and con at least consider here in committee and the piece again that it's not guaranteeing that we are but we're getting the design getting more information so I guess I would be leaning towards following what this committee was asking us to do and um, I think if we can get additional input from the administration before them I think that would be great to hear the full story of it um, and it sounds like the committee that gave us this recommendation also did a lot of work too and came to that 10-03 vote. So I'm the, jogging my memory here, Karen. So the committee was made up of four members from the House, four members from the Senate, 
and some outside folks. The outside folks were the sergeant at arms and Janet help me here because I'm going on <laughs> memory. Arts the Council. Sar the sergeant at arms, the friends of the state house, the arts council, um, and BGS, commissioner of BGS. And then there were eight from the legislature. So that was 11 folks. So I'm missing some people. Uh, Steve eight, Perkins. Eight, Pardon? Steve Perkins. From Steve Perkins, Perkins with the Historical Society. We had 11 members. Uh, so I have them here. You, uh, Representative Ansel, Representative Bartholomew, Senator Benning, Senator Clarkson, John Dumville from the Friends, Jennifer Fitch, Depart uh, our Commissioner, uh, Senator Ruth Hardy, Karen Middleman, and um, Steve Perkins, Anthony Polina, and Representative Shaw. So the three that were absent were Karen Middleman with the Arts Council, Senator Hardy, and the commissioner of BGS was not available that day. She had conflicts. Eric was sitting in her place, but he did not have the authority to vote. There were previous votes that were taken on different items. And, and the commissioner of BGS was present and the commissioner voted no and was the only one to vote no. And I can't remember what those items were. We can pull that up, but I can't remember. It was like back in October as we were working towards this. So it was a unanimous vote in favor, no one opposed and three absent. And the Arts Council was absent, BGS was absent and Senator Hardy. So I don't know if that helps or not. And some of the 10, some of the 10 wanted a broad expansion. They wanted to go out in wings on both sides of the state house. Others wanted to keep it more refined, just do the floor above the cafeteria. And that took about a, two months worth of discussion to get to this point. And the administration was not supportive of any of that during all of those conversations and votes. Uh, Kurt and then Marcia. Uh, I noticed this on the memo that the, it's only the first paragraph that was voted on. And what you just said about the difference in the committee about the kind of expansion, did there, was there consensus among the committee at the end that it should be a cafeteria on the second floor? And why didn't they include that in the motion? Well, the motion was, we were focused on trying to jumpstart the process. So the motion reflects the paragraph beneath it. Did the, did the 10 people agree that they wanted the library? Did they, did they change their mind? Uh, not the library, the, uh, the uh, cafeteria on the third floor, or were some of them still wanting to expand sideways? We came to an agreement with the, par the second paragraph. We agreed to that. And the way that gets carried out is the language in that first paragraph to jumpstart that particular process with appropriating 1.5 million to get the RFP out there for programming and schematic design to carry out the paragraph of moving the cafeteria to the top floor and converting cafeteria space to committees. That's okay, so there was, there was, was voted on. The first paragraph was voted on, but there was, there was a wide agreement that there should be a cafeteria on the third floor if there is yes. expansion. Okay. Yes. And you. the key was that the infrastructure needs for any future phases of expansion. That was the key. Mm -hmm. We're not there to do the broader expansion. Let's just do this first part. And, and when you do the first part, you build in some of the mechanics for the ability to expand down the road.
And in order to get that going, we agreed to jumpstart this by asking BAA, asking the appropriations committees for 1.5 million. Marsha. And obviously <clears throat> this plan was put in place a long time ago when they built the cafeteria with the idea of building a second floor. So Correct. it's nothing new. Correct. It's and just that right now we're in a position where we really need it and we have the money to do it. And then we're carrying that same thought, Marcia, that they did back in the mid eighties when they built that addition with the cafeteria, future legislatures may want a further addition. So let's build the cafeteria as a weight bearing floor so they can put a floor above it. So we're taking that same concept and saying, if you build this floor above the cafeteria and you do this construction, build in the infrastructure for possible future expansions. We don't know what those future expansions will look like, but at least build in some of your mechanical infrastructure for that. And then the question is, and I think Kurt has laid it out well, we've got a limited time frame in terms of we wanna use those ARPA dollars, which we talked about as a committee last year. If you remember in May, we talked about that 113 million that would be for infrastructure, capital infrastructure. And we wanted to divide it equally pretty much as we could between the administrative, the executive branch, the judicial branch and the legislative branch because we knew that we were gonna talk about an expansion. So we're just carrying that conversation to this. So Kurt is correct. We have a limited amount of money. We have a limited amount of time by the federal requirements to get that out the door. And we wanna make sure the BGS, if they're the lead agency or department, that they're gonna do this as a priority. So that's where we are. So anything else on this? What I will do is I will reach out to the administration and see if they're willing to come in and testify. And then I will see what, when that would be available. Um, and that to be on Tuesday, there's, unless there's time tomorrow, but I, I don't know how much time we're gonna be I know we're on the floor tomorrow, but I know that they're anticipating having some training sessions after the floor until about noontime. And then we're scheduled, I think we're, is it, I don't have the agenda in front of me. Are we at one o'clock or 1.30 tomorrow? We are at one o'clock tomorrow. One o'clock, yeah. So let me have a conversation with the administration, see if they're willing to come in or who will come in um, and see the time frame for that. Does that make sense to the committee? Okay, folks. Okay. So I think our work is done for the day. Um, time is at 3.30. Anything else? Okay. Whoops, actually, uh, there is some... <laughs> If you're looking for topics, um, somewhere along the line, and maybe not within the next two weeks, I'd like to get the full story on the on the battery and the generator, and why why the battery's been moved and things like that. Um, and also, there was talk in that uh, joint meeting of judiciary and the Senate over there when they were talking about um, uh, Beckett. And there was there were several remarks that, well, maybe we could uh, put youths like that temporarily at Marble Valley. Yep. And I'm wondering if there's any feasibility to that, because it would definitely I mean, if this is really a crisis and people were talking crisis, I know the word crisis is used, maybe overused. But if this is a crisis, if we can make a change to Marble Valley, that would take um, those kind of youth, at least temporarily, it would be better than having them in emergency rooms. 
I think. I hate to put kids in near prison. And of course, there's a sight and sound separation and all that sort of stuff that has to go on. But I, I also seem to remember hearing that it had been done before at Marble Valley. So I think if this is a crisis, we should look into that. Yeah, good point. So let's spend five minutes just seeing what other items folks would like to uh, maybe uh, start talking about next week. Anything raising to the top? I know we had some things doing a deeper dive on the budget, but that won't really happen, Karen, until, until we get the governor's proposed FY23 budget, then we can really see what's at stake. Um, I know some folks wanted to track the joint, uh, the Justice Reinvestment two investments. I think, again, that's gonna be more with the FY23 budget, I would think. And then the overview of federal dollars for capital items, that might be something that um, Dan and Becky could work on. What I'm thinking is having Becky come in next week. We talked about this with Phil. Uh, just sort of going over the language in the capital bill that we passed, uh, particularly these types of policy language that we put in just as a refresher for that and do that next week for that. So that would cover a little bit of the, we're gonna have a lot of con conversation about federal dollars being used for capital. We're gonna have a lot of conversations with that. And some of that will also be in the governor's recommended capital budget adjustment for that. Uh, so Scott? Question about how, how, how the capital budget adjustment works. So the governor's budget uh, presentation in a couple of weeks will cover both uh, annual appropriations and the capital. Uh, he will have his FY23 general fund budget. He will have his FY23 transportation budget and he will have his FY22, FY23 capital bill budget adjustment. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't paid attention to how this worked last uh, two years ago. Uh -huh. Uh, Karen? Yeah, so these aren't any immediate need. I'm just thinking for the session in general of um, when do we or do we get updates on the bills or initiatives that we passed last session? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. To just hear where those are at. Um, mm -hmm. I think that would be, I don't remember the numbers or things, but you know, things with DOC and all that, just to hear where, where they're at, that would be great. Yeah, we talked about that. Sarah, Mary, and I talked about that. Oh, at noon. We did. We had the big corrections bill that Dell was setting up the monitoring commission and um, looking at that. And then we also worked with Human Services Committee on the uh, forensic unit for that. And then we also did um, some work on the probation earned time for earned forgot what the term was, but for probation, that there would be some initiative there for, um, for people who are on probation that maybe if they be apply and conform to all the conditions that probation would be um, completed for them and that's sooner. Midpoint Time review, for, I think. Yeah, midpoint review. Right. So we've got those, we talked about that. And I'd be interested in hearing about the HVAC, uh, status of the HVAC work. We're scheduling that, Eric. We talked about that at noon, and Phil's going to reach out to Judy about the HVAC to, to give us an update on the work that's been done this year. So we talked about that, so we hope to do that next week. Can't get into the FY23 appropriation. Just give us... Um, an update on what's occurred over this past year. Great. Should Freeman, French Freeman be part of that, Eric? Or is that, can that be done with Joe and Tay maybe? Probably. I think probably. Joe and Tay can probably get you where you need to go. So we've got that scheduled. Yes. Um, anything else, members? trying to figure out next week. At this stage, it might be fine with just Joe. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah, we we'll do a deeper dive into it for sure when we get the yeah. budget. Yeah, we realized after the fact that we missed that in the go around of the spreadsheet mm -hmm. um, and the batteries. And it seems like there was one other project that was of note, but not necessarily. Now uh, we'll we'll come around to it, I'm sure. Okay. Anything um, else? Well, we finished. Don't off. forget Windsor, you have a report in place. Yes, we're, we've scheduled that. We're scheduling that the winds the report on the Windsor Correctional Facility, the task force. And um, I recommended to Phil that he reach out to you, Eric. Um, um I think that should be Tom Kennedy. I, right. I, so connect yeah. with Tom. Yeah. Connect with Tom on that. Because that's going to play in with some other conversations that are going to occur during the session. Well, and that, that's what uh, one big place that's sitting there losing money every day. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> have you seen the bill? What bill? <laughs> There's a bill. Um, I, I've only read through it once, but I think it would compel us to fit it up as a temporary youth facility within Senate 30 bill? days of adjournment. Is what? that Senate bill? Senate That'd be. Um, I, I think it was Toppers. Oh, okay. Topper McFawn. Okay, because it'll be introduced tomorrow. Yeah. It'll have to be fit up and open 30 days after we adjourn. It's a bit ambitious. It's a little. Anything else? No wonder, Eric, you don't have time to work, put that addition on the state house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just do as I'm told. By many people, <laughs> including us. Hey, Eric, I have a question for you. Do you know yes, a Justin sir. Staler? Justin Staler? He works for you? Yeah. He's my neighbor. To... Huh? He's my neighbor. Oh, okay. I'm trying. Oh, he's in operations, right? Yes, yeah. he is. Yeah. At least it's not her nephew. No, no, no. no this one's okay. this one's my neighbor. Yeah, he's actually been uh, working on the um, on the workplace integrated management system deployment. He's I've been on a lot of conference calls with him this past year. Mm -hmm. he, I picked oh, up he used to babysit his dad when he was young. <laughs> mm -hmm. That that brings up another question I had. Uh, okay, BGS, BGS was working on a uh, software for project management. That was a number of years ago, right? Well, we have been... we have a couple of big software deployments going on right now. Um, one of them, the the project management one, is in collaboration with VTrans. They have an existing system that they are uh, they've been using it for. I don't know, 15 years or so. And they're, I believe, going to be migrating to a web-based version, which is going to make it possible for us to have access to it. So we've been working with them on that. And then we have the Workplace Integrated Management System, which is sort of a, a whole organization backbone that starts with work orders and ends with capital planning. And we're going to be unleashing the, um, the operations and maintenance module, uh, hopefully, uh, in February. So that, um, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next one after that, that is lease management and all, all of our CAD drawings and everything is slowly moving into this system over the course of a couple of years. Okay. We gave approval for that in the money, what, three years ago? Two, three years ago? It wasn't yeah. last session. Yeah. The sessions are running into each other when you've been Zooming for. Mm -hmm three times here. So anything else before we finish up? Okie dokie. So thank you folks on YouTube and we will see you tomorrow, tomorrow at one o'clock.